Hmm. Oh, this is not the one. Again, this. Yeah. If you want Oscar to defend again, you can do a you know, a new session. <laughs> <laughs> and then you risk to be fake. I mean, you have to really defend the uh, real, right? <laughs> it's up to you. I am I in the defense spot right now, or yeah? Can I do on on a visual? Yeah, someone's actually got it. Sorry? Yeah, I have to do ah. But from my side, I guess it's okay already. Yeah, um, yeah. maybe it's just like that you can move to the next slide because uh, sometimes, uh, yes. Okay. It doesn't seem like you're recording, or at least you are recording, I guess. So I'm recording. Yes, yeah. I'm not recording. Okay. So what you see there is. Okay. Uh, yeah. But the, yeah, there's uh, yeah. a good thing. Yeah. So shall I start or no, we wait too many? We wait uh, 15 paths because mm -hmm. people can. Ah, of course. Decide. Yes. But it's one short. Sure. Sure. Okay, so it's it is, uh, like the it's right in the middle of Sweden, yeah, yeah. for a farm with the river and lake and okay. sea. Like, there is some big time, time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Just like one year, maybe two. Sounds really good. Nice. Nice. If I succeed, then I'll be happy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so um, maybe you can uh, close it up. Um, welcome to this uh, uh, defense of uh, the master program in data science. So we have Nicolas Martin. And uh, as you know, you can start with your five minute presentation, and then Lovita uh, will do an opposition, um, uh, possibly focusing uh, on uh, the like. Uh, the content of the thesis and maybe sending uh, more like syntactic uh, comments uh, separately. Uh, and, uh, and then we would have open questions, which will be answered uh, if time allows also from the audience. So please. Thank you. And so I will present the work of my thesis around how Lakehouse architecture can simplify data science pipelines. And I will use trace.earth as a case study. So this thesis builds on the project course uh, preceding this thesis, where I worked on data lakehouse architecture uh, with Oscar and uh, RAS supervision. And also I will use trace.earth as an example case, which I will explain in a minute. Uh, the main problem of focus uh, or uh, in initial problem, guiding problem, is how convoluted data pipelines can hamper data science work. And the improvement considered to alleviate this problem is uh, lake house data architecture. Based on this, I conduct several uh, explorations and working prototypes using Trace as an example. And based on the possibilities of um, processing bigger, bigger data sets and operational uh, data, I explore the enablement of new data uh, mining explorations. First, what is Trace.Earth? It is a data-driven transparency initiative that maps commodity supply chains that drive deforestation. It's a joint initiative between Stockholm Environment Institute and Global Canopy. Uh, to do this, it supports in a wide range of uh, data, um, trading data, shipment data, commodity production data, and depending on the commodity, this in this example, for example, beef production, it requires additional information, but it would be different for uh, let's say soy production or wood pulp or other commodities. It uses a logic-based decision tree and mathematical modeling that is common for uh, all the all the commodities. Um, and uh, uh, based on the models, they present the results in different ways. This is just an example of uh, some stanky flow charts where you can see uh, for a specific commodity how the different points in the chains are all linked together. But you can also like uh, download the data and have like data aggregations on the website and so on. 
But the real focus of uh, the thesis is, uh, or, or the example case of the thesis, is the complexity of their pipelines, because they have all their source data stored in a object store in Amazon S3. And based on this, I won't get into the nitty uh, gritty details here, but then they do all the pre-processing -pre and uh, after that they save again the files and then they model and then after they do some further process in database processing, they save again things here that they use for pre-processing. So very soon it becomes very, very entangled like spaghetti-like uh, pipelines. And if you go and look into the object store, uh, are you see deeply nested files which don't necessarily comply with the same but it's around 50,000 files mostly CSVs and JSONs but many times they don't have the same delimiters or they have some problems there and they do all of this through around 400 Python and R scripts. This of course is not a problem only of trace. In general, data scientists spend, tend to spend the largest amount of time on uh, pre-processing um, and pre uh, and uh, uh, these pre-processing challenges are related to pipeline complexity and the underlying data architecture. Data pipeline here, understanding it as a series of data processing steps that are uh, connected and managed. So, uh, these um, uh, data pipelines uh, and the way that they that they are structured and their simplicity and complexity is also related to the components that they that they use in the case of trace but it is very common uh, 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 component are data lakes where basically you have all your information centrally stored it could be on structures and structure structured um, but it has a common problem that is called like a data swamp that people just pour the information there but it doesn't have like an inherent way of organizing metadata or version. Well, it does have versioning, but it's not, it doesn't have the facilities to organize data well. Of course, this is a, not a new problem. This is an old problem and the most common solution in industry since the end of the 80s are data warehouses where you do have a central uh, source of information, but it is structured information and you expect the information here is organized and that you connect to different data sources. And additional to that, that is non-volatile. That data shouldn't be replaced, should be accessible, should, shouldn't be deleted in general, should be time variant. You should be able to query previous versions or uh, uh, time windows. And uh, many solutions now, they connect these two components. However, there are some problems. One of them is data staleness, because then you need to keep this replicated. Uh, so then there is that, some data staleness there. And also for machine learning and data scientists, sometimes you need the access to the raw data. So then this makes things more complex. And it requires computing code because you need to have this running all the time, uh, mostly, and usually vendor blocking. So in the last couple of years, an emerging architecture has, uh, has, has been uh, gaining a lot of traction. It's called the lake house, and as you can imagine, it's a mix of the two concepts. Uh, but the, the main idea is that, that uh, you can have these warehouse capabilities, but directly on the data lake. You don't need a two-tier um, uh, structure. And uh, with this, you can, allow, you can have schema on read, so you don't necessarily have to define previously the schema. So if you have a CSV, you can directly um, uh, like a, get the schema from it. And it also allows for acid transaction on stored tables. Uh, this is enabled by a transaction log on, on uh, each of the tables stored there. Usually tables are, most of the solutions are based on parquet uh, storage, but also Abro, RC, and others are available. And uh, so having this transaction log, then you, you can have um, scalability, performance, and uh, well, most of all, acid uh, capabilities. So then if we have this, uh, the idea is how can you pack from all this complexity to something more streamlined uh, here under what's called a medallion architecture data pattern, saying that you, you should initially have a, a set of tables for raw ingestion where you do uh, you can do schema on read here. Uh, it can come from batch, it can come from streaming, and uh, all, all the, you, you have all the history of the information here. And after doing some pre-processing, then you get to a silver tables, which are 
uh, filter, clean, and augmented. And after applying your models, you get to the goal tables that are usually the ones that uh, for the end uses and uh, analytics. And all of this happens on the object storage. So here you have the tables, not in another component, but uh, right here. Uh, so then you could uh, read and write directly to the S3 object store, making things uh, easier. So then what was explored was um, how to use this in Trace. The solution that I used was uh, using Databricks, but there are other solutions, Apache Iceberg that uh, you mentioned, Apache Hoodie. Uh, two weeks ago, Microsoft uh, launched uh, Microsoft Fabric that is also based on, on uh, Delta Tables open format. Um, but then like the idea is that in the future, Trace could have this kind of simple data flow and they could have, in the case using Databricks, they could have collaborative notebooks where they can write on Python or uh, uh, R or Scala um, or SQL. They can, um, they have a query engine and business intelligence so that they can do some of their current um, uh, uh, analytical works here. And maybe most importantly, they can define job workflows. Uh, I'll show you in a minute how, how it looks. Uh, and they can uh, define also declaratively a pipeline so that they can also um, integrate, for example, data quality around uh, the whole process. Now, this Sounds nice, but a big question, and not only for them, but in general, is how to integrate this into their workflow while keeping backwards compatible. And here, the main idea of uh, the implementation is that everything that they do on their current system should be reflected on these Delta tables. And that was a great part of the thesis work was to test this out. So, uh, basically, the idea is that Everything that they have here on their CLPs and everything that they have here on the uh, databases should be reflected here, should be allowed to be synchronized. So I did some um, uh, many scripts, more, most of them on PySpark and, and SQL to have this synchronization uh, initially manually, but they could be configured to, to be um, like even like real-time synchronized. And then uh, that they could use the same tools that they are using, let's say uh, their IDEs or they use Metabase or they use Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Hub and they could read directly from these tables. So then with time they could deprecate this use, but that they know that they could read or here from here or from here and this would contain always the same. And then they could also read from other open source clients and an additional thing that we did was to um, implement a data catalog so that they would have observability around everything that goes around here, 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 and here. Uh, who is managing it? What is this information? Even, even the, um, uh, the dashboards um, can be reflected on this um, component. So to, to give a sense of how it looks with this solution. <clears throat> so here we have a, a three level like catalog database tables where the tables, we can see their history, governance, uh, lineage, and so on. They can be read from a wide variety of uh, different places. You can define the uh, workflows or as a direct as a cyclical graphs where you uh, select if it's a script or um, if uh, what kind of computing you want for this or uh, defining declaratively the, the pipeline and, and saying, uh, well, if uh, this data doesn't comply to this data quality of the table of our, or a relationship between the table then, or drop the record or stop the process or put the data in quarantine and so on. And here, the example of the data catalog, well, you can see also uh, the information and data lineage to the column level among others. For this part, some of the conclusions, um, indeed, it can simplify data pipelines, uh, uh, including uh, integrating warehouse features, and it can be backward compatible. It can rely mostly on open standards and have uh, like a widely reduced cost, at least on, on, a, on their case. However, something to note is that a transition to have backwards compatibility of course, it's challenging to implement, and this is additional to the technology. Uh, simplifying to this medallion data pattern, this is more, more mostly a way of organizing things. 
uh, can be challenging to to implement, and it requires uh, uh, is mostly like cultural challenges on how, how you adapt your workflows, and that's difficult. Some of the future work on uh, this part, um, exploring with other light lightweight lake house implementations. One that is gaining a lot of traction is Delta with using Arrow and uh, DocDB for in-process uh, analytics without requiring a Spark engine, for example. Uh, working more around metadata management, some uh, things around semantic layer and data fabric that uh, uh, is something that, that could help to organize their information that is one of the key problems. And uh, I would say mainly do a parallel with similar complex data pipeline settings so that the work that is done here is easier to um, make the parallel with other similar um, kind of work. So based on, on this, um, initially, the idea was to um, knowing that we can process better uh, data, operational data, then to see how to uh, integrate other type of uh, analysis um, that could enable, in this case, um, uh, graph, data, graph data mining explorations. Uh, so this was done. Um, there is, uh, I'll explain in, at, at the end, there is like a kind of uh, missing link in the sense that the, here I focus mainly on the graph modeling and not so much the connection with the data. So that I'll explain that at the end. So here, what we, uh, uh, what, what I work with based on, on Trace's uh, previous work is to take uh, data from uh, sanitary records, public sanitary records of animal movements in Brazil. Um, and then what we got was 2 million JSON records where we have the information of each uh, cattle movement in, uh, in, in this case, in the state of Pará in Brazil. Each cattle movement, we can know which farm it originates, which farm it goes to, the tax number, the geolocation, how many animals move from one side to the other, and, uh, and what are the characteristics, characteristics of the animal movements. Based on this, we got the information around, around 6,000 uh, slaughterhouses, 200,000 farms, and around 55 million uh, animal transported. And um, the work done with this was uh, modeling it. For this, I used a Neo4j uh, database that is a native graph database, where basically the information of the farms, then I, I save it here, and here's some aggregations of which farm sent to which farm by year or in total, uh, but also which farm uh, sends each specific animal group to or another farm or a slaughterhouse, uh, and some additional information around geolocation or uh, other relevant information that they needed. So based on this, to give just like a simple example, then we would have here a slaughterhouse. And then if a group of animals come to this, let's say 15 animals uh, come to this slaughterhouse, we know the characteristics of each groups of animals, its sex, its age range in uh, months, and its uh, transport date from which farm is coming. And this farm also which animal groups it uh, is receiving and so on. So then we have a graph of uh, like the whole whole um, animal movements. And then as we have it modeled as a graph, it is very easy then to do simple queries just to see um, for different degrees of separation, for instance, but also, of course, many other options to, to do some analysis on the graph. One of such analysis, uh, and from, from here on, is like a, the kind of the, the novelty of uh, some things that, uh, that haven't been done with, like with this um, uh, kind of depth was to uh, do a better support set of possible animal sources. So to do a support set of the, the, the possible indirect supply chains. Because then if we know that uh, this animal group has these characteristics of sex of, or, uh, or um, um, age range and so on, then we could know that, this, that there are other animal groups that are connected that, that could be possible sources for these animal groups. So then we could uh, constrain a support set of uh, uh, how an animal group that is reaching a slaughterhouse could have originated from other animal groups. And based on this, uh, for instance, um, let's say with this slaughterhouse, we could say all reachable farms 
what is the maximum possible number of animals that could have reached from the other farms. So from, and this is just an example or, or uh, organizing it by, by a third degree connection. So then this farm could have sent a maximum of 41,000 animals to this lotter house. Not that it did send these animals, but that is the maximum. So that, that would give a sense of the exposure of a slaughterhouse to farms. Let's say if these farms come from, uh, and these farms and, and the animal movement come from uh, a region that has had deforestation at certain date, then we would know what would be the exposure of the slaughterhouse of, um, of uh, receiving this animal. Um, other analysis uh, are enabled, of course, if we have already the, the graph model based on the, uh, on the modeling and the support set. Um, I won't go in, into the detail of this, but so, some of the things that, uh, uh, that were tested was, uh, for example, a community detection is using a, a specific Louvain um, implementation that is a, a common um, algorithm for community detection. So to know which, um, are the trading communities between slaughterhouses and farms. Um, this is relevant for many different reasons because it's like the kind of analysis that usually researchers do to see what are the, well, how the trading communities behave, what are their impacts when there is policy change among others. Um, other uh, analysis were done using uh, centrality, uh, using page rank, I think I also did vector centrality uh, um, so that we also could see like which are the most um, like central farms or central slaughterhouses and another one um, was using shortest path to identify the most transited paths so then here the idea is uh, like relatively simple if we have an origin farm here and then we have a destination farm or slaughterhouse but that uh, has um, um, like an intermediate connection. So then let's say that this origin farm is sending 100 animals here, and then this farm is sending 50 animals here. So we would like to know, like not of course, not only the number of possible animals, but what would be the most transited paths between a given farm and farm or farm and slaughterhouse. So then uh, what was done was um, to hear um, uh, calculate shortest path using the inverse as a weight, the, as a cost, the inverse of the animal scent. So then this would give us a, a, a ge geometric uh, network model. Um, and uh, we could like easily know that, for example, in, in, in this case, the, the, the path with, the, with the, uh, the shortest path would be this path. And, and based on this, um, we could, for example, say, okay, so let's say that we have this farm and we would like to know the shortest paths to the slaughterhouses that are uh, at most four hops away. We could have this information and, of course, then look at the de detailed information around uh, this kind of paths. So then with this, um, we could say, for instance, if we know that there is a region with deforestation uh, and uh, at the deforestation event, then we could know which are the, the closest reachable far, uh, slaughterhouses in terms of the most transited paths, or the other way around. If I am a slaughterhouse, and this is a, a big issue for them because they only have visibility up to their first provider. If I'm a slaughterhouse, then I can see what are the most transited paths to some regions of interest, and then continue my due diligence based on this. So, so conclusions based on this, uh, Graph exploration one and uh, the, the immediate one is that we have an improved, I mean, improved support set of possible indirect supply chain. So, uh, like not only based on how many animals farms are sending each other, but constraining it uh, based on sex, age range, and uh, transport date. We explored some basic algorithmic applications, community detection, centrality, and most transited paths, and some of the future work. Um, this is the missing link to use the lake house for orchestration of ingestion, pre-processing as well as storage of results. Uh, because uh, this is something that currently has currently blocked them from like exploring this kind of work. So um, 
yeah, so, so making this connection of uh, using the lake house, extending to other supply chains, of course, because th this is a supply chain issue like in general and supply chains in general could have this kind of modeling and integrating additional information that they have and exploring the potential of deriving likelihood measurements of the indirect sources of animals. Um, because we just did an exploration, but of course we could go deeper and not just say like, ah, this could be a possible exposure, exposure sorry, but um, also um, deriving specific uh, uh, likelihood measurements, knowing however that we don't have uh, a ground truth. Like probably we have some, sometimes uh, there is a journalist investigation, but we don't have like a real ground truth uh, to, to work on. Um, this, these two um, are currently on, on a funding, uh, are part of also a funding proposal that they are doing. So hopefully this uh, will continue um, to um, yeah, be explored. And uh, well, finally, some thanks, um, of course, to Raz for the opportunity to work on this and uh, patience uh, to, to work with me and um, and uh, to Oscar, of course, we worked with this before and the people from, from the, the Traces team, Harry and Vivian. Um, um, the, the code is here in this link and uh, here are some of the references um, that I mentioned here and very happy to hear your feedback and questions. Thanks. So, you can uh, share and uh, stop the your position. Uh, I think the stuff was running. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah.